tonight for our panel uh, entitled Bringing the Global Local, Resisting Wars at Home and Abroad. We're here tonight to talk about the threats posed to international peace and security as presented by uh, US nationalism and Trump's so-called foreign policy. We'll also talk about um, the issues that the policies that the Trump administration has posed um, that have targeted vulnerable communities such as Muslims, refugees, immigrants, and other um, vulnerable minority groups. Um, my name is Razan. I am an intern here at IPS working with the Communications Department. I am also a Muslim Palestinian American. I was born in the Middle East, but I was raised here. Uh, so a lot of these issues are very intersectional to me. They're um, very relevant to my experiences and they hit uh, pretty close to home. And I'm uh, co-moderating the panel with Razan. My name is Michelle Majanat. I am on the development team here at IPS. Um, also have a background in Arab studies, um, lived in Jordan, Palestine. So issues of exile, uh, refugees, and uh, occupation and imperialism are really relevant to me. So I'm looking forward to the discussion that is going to ensue on the panel. Great, on that panel, we have uh, three of our wonderful IPSers. Uh, to my left is Phyllis Bennett, who is the director of the New Internationalism Project here at IPS. Um, yay! <laughs> 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 They're the ones who come in late. <laughs> uh, she's working as a writer, activist, uh, and an analyst on Middle East and UN issues. She's also the founder of the U.S. campaign to end the Israeli occupation. Co-founder. -co Co-founder. Co How humble she is. <laughs> um, and has worked with many anti-war organizations, in addition to speaking widely across the U.S. and around the world as part of the anti- uh, or part of the global peace movement. Uh, right next to her is Maha Hinad, who just joined IPS earlier this month um, as the Michael Ratner Middle East Fellow. Uh, she is working with Phyllis on anti-Islamophobia and anti-war mobilization, amongst other projects related to the Middle East um, and Muslims. While earning her PhD, Maha focused on the impact of 9-11 on Muslim communities in the U.S. and worked and organized with various groups on issues addressing the civil and human rights abuses as related to the crimes perpetuated by the global war on terror. Finally, we have John Pfeffer, who is the Director of Foreign Policy and Focus at IPS, um, and is our expert on Asia um, and the Pacific, military and peace, and foreign policy overall. He's the author of several books and articles, and has worked as an international um, affairs representative <coughs> in Eastern Europe and East Asia for the American Friends Service Committee and has studied and traveled widely throughout the world, teaching graduate level courses and presenting lectures to universities across the nation. All right, there great. Um, so before we launch into the panelist portion, I just wanted to kind of read aloud from, uh, I think, uh, historical text, which I think is uh, really relevant to the current time period, but also was written around, the around 1953. Um, and it is M.A. Cesar's Discourse on Colonialism. Mm -hmm. Uh, Aimé Cesar was a Francophone and French poet, author, and politician from Martinique. He was one of the founders of the Negritude movement in Francophone literature. He taught Franz Fanon and would become a great influence for Fanon and also would serve as a mentor and a contemporary for Fanon. And this piece, which I'll be reading from, um, Discourse on Colonialism, was an essay describing the strife between a colonizer and a colonized. Um, and if we are connecting um, kind of global and local resistance in the entire world movement, I think it's important to return to kind of the knowledge and the lessons of the anti-colonial movement in the past. And so um, I'm going to begin reading the selection. <clears throat> People are surprised. They become indignant. They say, how strange, but never mind. It's Nazism. It will pass. And they wait, and they hope, and they hide the truth from themselves that it is barbarism, the supreme barbarism, the crowning barbarism that sums up all the daily barbarisms, that it is Nazism. Yes, but that before they were its victims, they were its accomplices. That they tolerated that Nazism before it was inflicted on them, that they absolved it, shut their eyes to it, legitimized it, because until then, it had, applied, it had been applied only to non-European peoples. That they have cultivated that Nazism, that they are responsible for it, and that before engulfing the whole edifice of Western Christian civilization in its reddened waters, it oozes, seeps, and trickles from every crack. And so I'll now turn it over to Phyllis. Well, thank you both. Um, that's a good introduction. Starting with anti-colonial history is always a good place to start. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Welcome to everybody and welcome to those who are listening and watching online and on Periscope. 
That's a new one for us. <laughs> um, we can start with a bit of good news. The resistance has had a victory tonight. Some of you may have already heard that the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the ban on the Muslim ban. So Muslim ban 2.0 is uh, on its way to the dustbin in history where it should have been already. Uh, but I think that's a very important sign. The, the Muslim ban one and two uh, were among the parts of the resistance that have been mobilized the most powerfully and the most profoundly. And I think that was something that was both um, exciting for many of us to see and surprising for many of us to see that it was the issue of an attack on Muslims that energized and mobilized people across this country, all kinds of people who had not necessarily fought against Islamophobia in the past, who had not necessarily been aware of Islamophobia in the past, and suddenly were moved in that direction. So that was a, a huge thing. And what we can take away from it is clearly these judges have recognized that all those people at the airports flooding into the protests, all those lawyers suddenly saying, we're here to help, what do you need? all those judges that were finding these things to be unconstitutional, that we have their back and that we have made it possible for the judges to do the right thing. So I think that's a very important component of our resistance. I gotta say, I was a little worried about the judges. We haven't had to have brave judges for a while in this country. You know, individually, yeah, maybe here and there, but basically judges didn't have to be so brave. And I was worried that they weren't gonna be up to it. And it turns out because we were in the streets and made clear that we had their back, they didn't have to feel that they were somehow standing alone. They turned brave. They found a backbone somewhere. So this is all good news. On the international front, it's not such good news. On the international front, things are going from very, very bad to significantly worse. And I think the recent trip that Trump has been on, this junket across the Middle East, has made things indeed worse still. Uh, we've been seeing escalations in the wars. I'm not gonna go through the whole history. You know a lot of it. You've heard me and others talk about it for years now. These are not new wars that Trump is waging. He is escalating existing wars. These were Bush's wars, some of which he created and some of which he revitalized from before. These were Obama's wars who carried them out differently, but carried them out nonetheless. And these are now being escalated by Trump in a whole new and very dangerous way. Uh, the speech that we heard in Riyadh, which if you saw the Washington Post today and saw Newt Gingrich saying that this is history in the making, this is the equivalent to what he said was the history that we saw in 1982 when Ronald Reagan went to Europe and said, the world must unite against Soviet something or other, and the world did so, says Newt Gingrich, and the world came together and said, really, that's what happened exactly? But this is a very dangerous moment because what we saw here was exactly not what Newt Gingrich said it was. If this was not mobilizing the world to take on terrorism in a serious way that might actually deal with the problem of terrorism, which is indeed one of many significant problems that we face in the world, certainly not the only one, it's not, for most people, the most important one, but it is an important issue. It's not going to be helped by what we heard from Donald Trump. Because number one, this was not primarily about stopping terrorism. This was about stopping Iran. And stopping Iran, when you talk about mobilizing a global coalition, or in this case, the Sunni Arab core of that coalition, is designed to create more war, not less. And when you have more war, you have more terrorism both as part of war and as response to war. War creates terrorism, just like war creates refugees. So what we have now with this escalation, we're already seeing escalations in <coughs> Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen in particular, and it's Yemen that's perhaps at the most risk right now, because what we're seeing is the call for greater mobilization militarily against Iran and the excuse is going to be that Iran is somehow responsible for terror. It's fascinating to read what the State Department says about Iran as the, the biggest supporter of global terrorism in the world. And you read through it and it's like, they're not mentioning any actual terrorism. Why? Because it's not Iran that's responsible for, for supporting and financing and arming real terrorists. There's a lot of different forces that are doing that, Saudi Arabia being probably <laughs> suspect number one. Iran's not even on that list. So that's a big part of the problem. The way that Yemen comes into this 
is that we're seeing the excuse being made for why the U.S. has to sell Saudi Arabia $110 billion worth of new weapons, including these specific weapons that it has already been using to devastating results in Yemen, the most impoverished country in the Arab world already, 10,000 people dead in this war already, several million already facing imminent famine. Imminent, imminent. There are already children dying of starvation and lack of medical care in Yemen, and now cholera has broken out. Now, what does that have to do with Iran? Essentially nothing. But what we're being told is that the war in Yemen is somehow standing against Iranian meddling. Because Iran, on occasion, has provided some minimal financial and uh, strategic support to the Houthi rebels, who are an indigenous rebel force in Yemen that have been operating in Yemen for decades. They're not Iranian puppets. In fact, two years ago, when Iran told them, do not try and take Sana'a, do not try and take the capital. They said, thank you for your advice, and they went and took the capital. Because they're not tools of Iran. They were. It might have gone a little better for them, frankly. But they're not, and they didn't listen, and they are now enmeshed in a brutal war, which is very one-sided. It's the Saudis backed by the UAE and backed by the United States, which is not only providing all the arms sales in the world, Saudi Arabia, of course, buys more arms than anybody else in the world from the United States, but the US is also participating directly. We are sending US Air Force refueling planes to refuel the Saudi bombers in air so they can be more efficient. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about serious new levels of escalation. And in the context of this speech, we're seeing what is claimed to be a, a new approach to foreign policy and what is actually the old foreign policy of start with war and worry about diplomacy later. And that's the problem we face because among other things, we know it doesn't work. It doesn't work to end terrorism. The U.S. has been at war with terrorism for 15 years, and terrorism is doing just fine because you can't bomb terrorism out of existence. You bomb cities, you bomb people. Sometimes you might get lucky and bomb a terrorist. And maybe it's even the right terrorist on the side that you want to get because there's terrorists on all sides these days. But if you do, what happens? Chances are that person also has a family and a town and a country and a community and a religious group that probably doesn't think they're a terrorist, even if maybe they are in the definition of killing civilians, et cetera, et cetera. But maybe other people don't see it that way. And some of those people are gonna be pretty angry that you invaded their country to kill their people. And some of those angry people are gonna get really angry and turn violent. So we see this question of blowback very close to the top of the agenda. And if we look at Yemen, According to pretty much everybody, if you have to weigh terrorist operations that are functioning out there in the world, among those that are looking for international effect, which isn't most of them, most of them have goals that are very close to home, but there's a few that kind of have broader goals. One of them is the group of Al-Qaeda forces based in Yemen. And according to most people who know about this sort of thing, some of whom really don't, but they claim to, but some of them really do, pretty much everybody agrees that that's the group that actually has more capacity than anyone else to do things like figure out how to blow up computers on a plane and blow up a plane in the sky. They're the most dangerous ones. So of course, that's who we're going after with bombs designed to antagonize everybody else. Isn't that a smart move? So this is what the quote new foreign policy is all about. So finally, I, I'm, we're, we're just doing some little introductory comments here. We're not doing a full speech. So I, I just want to mention a couple of other very quick things. One is the question of the military budget. The full budget has just been released, right? We saw the skinny budget a few weeks ago and freaked out and then thought, well, maybe it'll be a little different. Maybe they'll, they'll hear some of the opposition and the full budget will be a little different. Well, guess what? It wasn't. So we still have in the full budget plans for a, wait for it, $54 billion escalation in military spending and a $54 billion reduction in things like diplomacy, the State Department, 30% cutback, EPA, keeping our environment safe, 30% cutback. It's extraordinary the, how these things balance out. Who said it's not a balanced budget? You take $54 billion out of things like protecting the environment, diplomacy. You know, if you don't have diplomats, 
You can't have diplomacy. You go to war. That's your choice, you know? So that's the choice they've made. This is, this is the choice that we're now dealing with. This budget, which is so cruel in its cuts to things like Medicare. Yes, Medicare, not only Medicaid. Part of Medicare is being cut. Medicaid is being slashed. Everything that poor people have depended on for so long and have been cut and cut already is being slashed to the bone. And what is doing great in this budget? Rich people and the Pentagon. The gazillionaires and the generals. That's who's doing great on this budget. So that whole question has to be at the core of how we take up the challenge to war. Because it's not just about building an anti-war movement that is a consciously self-defined movement against war. We have to be sure that these trade-offs are clear for every other movement that's working for immigrant rights to defend refugees, for women's rights, for economic justice against inequality, for Black Lives Matter. All of these movements need the information about the military budget. And it's up to those of us who define ourselves as anti-war folks to get that into the hands of those people. Just for example, this $54 billion escalation goes to the, the main budget of the Pentagon, which doesn't include things like taking care of veterans, the nuclear arsenal, and wait for it, it doesn't include war. How's that? You know, they have, war has its own budget. But the main budget of the Pentagon, that's still 54 cents out of every discretionary dollar, $568 billion. And you could, among other things, you could hire six and a half million elementary school teachers with that money. You could have nine and a half million infrastructure jobs out of this $54 billion escalation, just the $54 billion escalation. So why do we have Islamophobia on the rise? It's not just an accident. Maha will talk more about it, but the key question for us right now is, what's the link to war? You build Islamophobia because you wanna convince people it's okay to go to war against Muslim majority countries. So that's why this is all about war. And just to finish, I think that we have to keep in mind history. And who better to teach us that than the great historian Howard Zinn, who I think probably half or more of the people in this room have read The People's History of the United States, yes? Yes, I'm seeing a lot of nods. For those of you not in the room, a lot of people are nodding. But Howard taught us one thing that is really crucial, that we can walk and chew gum at the same time, that there are two histories of our country, that this is a country who made its fortune, made its power, built its nationhood on the back of slavery and genocide. The genocide of the indigenous population and slavery of black Africans who were brought to the United States in chains. But this is also the country that from day one was the country of movements against genocide and slavery. The movements against Jim Crow, Jim Crow segregation, I can't even talk anymore. The movements for women's rights, the movements to protect the environment, all of the movements that have shaped this country have been part of our country in parallel to the genocide and slavery that shaped the power and the economic clout of this country. We have to keep in mind both of those histories all the time. And that's our work today, to reclaim them. Thank you. So thank you everyone for being here today. And thank you, Phyllis, who's been an awesome mentor. Um, so I wanna kind of start by putting things in context and looking at some of the more current and recent events that have happened in the last week. Um, so I'm sure all of you have heard about the Manchester attacks that happened a couple days ago. And um, when Trump responded to those attacks, he was in Palestine at the time, he said, our society can have no tolerance for this continuation of bloodshed. We cannot stand a moment longer for the slaughter of innocent people. And in today's attack, it was mostly innocent children. So we can condemn these attacks as we should, but it's important to think about whenever it's a Muslim perpetrator of violence, we hear this kind of language being used. That is that there is sort of this moral equivalency that state violence is somehow much more or is much less egregious than violence that's committed by non-state actors, right? And so we have to kind of think about this continuation of this narrative, right? This idea, again, that somehow when these Muslim perpetrators exact acts of violence, that it's somehow just much worse. And why is that important? It's important because of what is then 
used to legitimize or justify further repression and war, right? So Phil has talked a lot about the sort of this war economy and the ways that the US has continued to perpetuate war, particularly in the Middle East. But I wanna go back again to this incident um, and talk about the perpetrator in particular of the Manchester attacks who was um, of Libyan descent. Now, if you read any of the articles about um, the suspect, who he was, they talked about the fact that he was a 22 year old, had recently gone to Libya. And it was very interesting to see how that was a particular point of stress, right? That he had just returned home from Libya as if someone who has this sort of background is inherently a terrorist, right? You can't just return to your home country for a visit without it being something that's suspect. Furthermore, um, in an NPR article, when they talked about the suspect, they said um, his neighbors told NPR that they did not know him well. Some of them recall an incident in which a resident complained to police several years ago that members of the Abedi family had shown signs of radicalization. And then it just ends. What does that mean? What does it mean that this Muslim family showed signs of radicalization? Does it just mean that they were wearing some sort of Muslim garb? Does it mean that they saw them growing a beard? What does that mean? Right? And it's this kind of language that's consistently used to buttress and support this narrative of a threat of terrorism, even when Muslims are simply just perhaps practicing their religion. Next, we had um, Trump's NATO speech today, right? And I think that that was also an important point to consider when we're thinking about war and war economy in the Middle East. So uh, Trump talked about this barbaric attack on our civilization. And if anyone here has heard of the clash of civilizations, which I'm sure most of you have, you will know that this language is repeatedly used to justify war and in particular against this sort of Muslim world, whatever that is, right? To just justify that language that there is inherently this division between the Muslim world, again, whatever that is, and the Western world, right? And we always have this clash. So we always need to have this force of war that serves to directly challenge that. And then Trump said, you have thousands and thousands of people pouring into our various countries and spreading throughout. And in many cases, we have no idea who they are. We must be tough, we must be strong, and we must be vigilant. The NATO of the future must include a great focus on terrorism and immigration. How interesting that he makes this connection on the day that the Fourth Circuit Court upholds uh, upholds the sort of the stay on this, um, the ban, right? So it's interesting to number one for that reason, and number two, because of this explicit connection that he wants to make in terms of terrorism and immigration, that there is a connection, that we should be fearful of immigrants, that we should um, support sort of um, the xenophobic narrative and discourses that exist to, again, justify this, uh, the language of war. So what I then wanted to kind of show you all, um, just to kind of get at this point, and, and when we talk about this idea that war creates refugees, right? In some ways, we have this idea that refugees are innocent people, right? And in part, that's why there has been so much mobilization and galvanizing of people to kind of directly challenge um, attacks on people, these refugees that are innocent people trying to come to the country. Now, I did a quick search um, a couple of weeks ago on, I just looked up Muslim refugees on um, Google Images. And just one second so you can actually see. Um, so this is what happens when you look up Muslim refugees on Google Images, right? So this one says, in, in case you can't read it, the savages that are raping European women and children by the thousands are not ISIS, they are just Muslim refugees. In other words, all Muslims are inherently terrorists, are inherently evil, are inherently barbaric, and we should distrust all of them, right? This one, it says, rape you, rape you G's not welcome. This one says, terrorists welcome, bring your weapons. And if you recognize this poster, it's, I assume, a mock-up of the sign that's uh, along the California-Mexico border in which they're trying to, you know, deter uh, immigrants coming from South, South and Central America. And this one says, we hate to bring this up, but, weren't, but weren't the Sarnaev brothers refugees? Oh yeah, they were, right? So again, demonizing refugees, and in addition, putting it outside of the context of US wars. This one says zero refugees from countries included in the president's travel ban have killed anyone in terrorist attacks on American soil. Now this might seem like a positive message, but what it doesn't do is challenge the narrative of collective responsibility. So in other words, if there had been an attack by someone from one of those countries, it would be okay to ban them from the country. So we have to kind of think of what is the reverse message that's embedded in this. 
And then lastly, this one says, meet your neighbors. And as you can see, it's a group of Muslim um, immigrants, refugees, one of whom is hoarded, holding a sword. And again, this is just me doing a simple Google search on Muslim refugees. So in my mind, this is some of the language and the images that are used to think about and to justify the war economy, right? And when we think about the Muslim ban in particular, as Phyllis said, it is indeed a huge victory. Um, but in my mind, what, is, what has been quite surprising about it is even though in the decision they said um, that the executive order drips with religious intolerance, animus, and discrimination, that's precisely what the entire war on terror has been doing since its onset in 2001. Um, so it's, it is a, in some ways very surprising that it's only now that we're seeing this kind of outrage and momentum against challenging policies that are fundamentally Islamophobic. So when we talk about also this idea of the war economy um, that Phyllis went over, there's also the idea of a militarized budget, right? So it's not just what we're sort of expending for wars outside of the country, but what kind of resources we're devoting to things like law enforcement internally and domestically, right? So what are we, what are we doing in terms of homeland security? What about immigration um, enforcement, incarceration? These are all the things we need to be thinking about in terms of what supports this war economy. What is it that um, the society and community is really thinking about when it comes to violence? And this is state violence, right? Whether it's inflicted on our communities domestically or whether it's inflicted on communities abroad. They go hand in hand. And if we're gonna to try to dismantle sort of this war economy outside of our borders, we have to think about the ways we're perpetuating it within our borders. So I think that that's sort of another point, uh, important point that we also need to think about. And when I think about the US in particular and how it's involved in the Middle East, I think it's great that Michelle started out um, by talking about colonialism because it seems that the US cannot interact with the Middle East in any other way than some sort of colonialist, colonialist reform of the Middle East, right? So it's either colonization, it's imperialism, it's intervention, it's militarism, it's always through this sort of very colonial lens that we're always trying to save the Middle East, right? That we need to help those people, right? And when um, the Pentagon released a report earlier today in regards to a US bombing in Mosul, um, in which they discovered that it killed over 100 civilians, right? And this is something they had been denying for quite some time. Um, a spokesperson for this operation said, our goal has always been for zero civilian casualties, but the coalition will not abandon our commitment to our Iraqi partners because of ISIS's inhumane tactics, terrorizing civilians, using human shields and fighting from protected sites such as schools, hospitals, religious sites, and civilian neighborhoods. So number one, that obscures the fact that um, the US entered um, and destroyed US in the first place in 2003, right? And number two, this is specifically designed to put what has happened in Iraq in humanitarian terms, right? So to justify our presence in those terms as opposed to in militaristic terms, in financial terms, what are we gaining from this? No, we're not actually gaining anything. We're there to help the people of Iraq because they need to be helped. They need to be um, supported in their fight against ISIS. So I think there are a lot of important things we need to think about um, more broadly when we think about uh, the war on terror um, with escalation of wars in the Middle East, and in particular, some of the aspects of the narrative and the ways in which uh, violence in particular is justified vis-a-vis um, -vis Islamophobia, racism, xenophobia in the Middle East and domestically as it impacts Muslims. So I will end there. <laughs> Wow, well, thank you both for the presentations and for your framing. Ordinarily here at IPS, what you would expect now would be me talking about Asia Pacific. That's my specialty. And if you're interested in the Q&A, you can ask me any questions you want about North Korea, recent election in South Korea, situation in Japan. Mongolia. Mongolia. <laughs> no, nothing about Mongolia. <laughs> um, but I'm not going to talk about Asia Pacific because I've been asked to actually do something entirely different, something dramatic. Because the other thing that I do here at IPS is arts work. I do theater, I do fiction, uh, and I have tried to kind of take foreign policy and global issues and, well, you heard them dramatized here, but dramatize them in a different context on stage. 
Um, for instance, I did a play called Interrogation in which we invited everybody to this play and the understanding that there would be door prizes and free food. And instead we brought them up on stage and interrogated them. <laughs> they were surprised to say the least. I'm not gonna do that this evening. Um, something else I've done is a novel called Splinterlands in which I kind of imagined what kind of the impact of Trump and Le Pen and Brexit in 2050. What will the world look like in 2050 if these politicians continue to be voted into office or seize power? And then most recently, I have a play coming out in July that looks at the issues of race, class, and gender on, uh, on campus, uh, but also looks at some global questions as well. But tonight, uh, originally this, this panel was called something else. It was actually called Woke. And we changed that. But before we changed the topic, before we changed the title, I'd already decided what I was going to do tonight. Um, and it was too late to change. Uh, and it's part of kind of my attempt after the elections to try to figure out what does it mean to do storytelling these days in this political environment when we have fake news, when we have a president who just lies and sets a new standard of lying. I mean, we had presidents who lied before, but this, this team, he lies more often than he tells the truth. How do you approach that from a storytelling point of view? So that's something that I've been thinking about since the election. But tonight, with the help of Phyllis and Mandisa, we're gonna do something else. And before we start, let me emphasize that this is not a true story. Mandisa is not my daughter. <laughs> Phyllis is not my doctor. And although I work at a foreign policy think tank, I am not this person. that we don't do or say anything that could upset him. He's, he's been through a lot already. The car accident, the four month long coma. He doesn't need any more bad news. It could lead to a major setback. Hillary. No, Dad, it's Maggie. It's me, your daughter, Maggie. As I said, he's in a very fragile state. Hillary, the election. Is the election over? Did, did Hillary win? Maybe this isn't the time to talk about politics. Uh, Dad, oh, of course. Of course Hillary won. You did good, Dad. You did good, it's okay. It was the day after, it was the day before the election. Back in November, I was driving out to Manassas, out in Virginia, to the Democratic Party headquarters to get another list of addresses so I could continue to canvas to get out the vote to make sure that Hillary Clinton was elected. Oh, look, she was not my all time favorite candidate. I was more a fan of Bernie Sanders, but the prospect of her opponent. Winning the election back in November sent ice water coursing through my veins. So I took off a whole week of work to make sure that Hillary Clinton got elected. I work at a foreign policy think tank, but, but I thought that election was the most important political event of my lifetime. So, so I was driving out to Manassas, and I remember hearing my phone. It was a text message 
someone that sent me the latest polling data, Hillary Clinton had a 75% chance of winning the election. I remember thinking, wow, she really will win. I can stop worrying. I can stop walking around with my fists clenched. My daughter, Maggie, she filled in the rest of the story for me. Apparently, I, I swerved to avoid hitting a jogger, and I smashed into a concrete wall. Maggie tells me that it was touch and go there for a while, that I was in a coma for four months, that I'm lucky to be here. And I tell her, we are all lucky. We're all lucky we avoided an accident back in November. We're lucky we elected Hillary Clinton. Oh, but she's far from perfect. She's not a car wreck. Look at all these people. Maggie, thank you for showing me these photos. I really, I really wish I could have been at her inauguration. But I have a question. What, what do all these pink hats mean? <laughs> oh, well, Dad, uh, that was just a way to, to show all the women supporters out in the crowd that day. A sea of pink. It must have been an amazing event. Yeah, it was an amazing event. I just wish I could, I could watch television. Dad, your doctor said, not until you're okay. He said you're in a very fragile state. And what, you don't like me reading the newspaper to you every morning? <laughs> it just seems you're leaving things out. The Dow is going up, the weather's unseasonably warm, but nothing seems to be happening. Uh, it looks like the French are going to beat Le Pen in the presidential elections. That's reassuring, but, but I have some very specific foreign policy questions. But Dad, your doctor said, honey, I've been home from the hospital for a week. How much stronger do I have to get to be able to talk about war and peace? Maggie, you're a journalist. You have the inside scoop. It's practically criminal for you to keep me in the dark. Okay, Dad. Fire away. Okay. Well, has Hillary followed up on the Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations? Uh, those are still up in the air. Well, then, what about the war in Syria? That's, that's still going on. Well, then what about Russia? Ah, Russia. We haven't escalated with Russia, have we? Maggie, we're not at war with Russia. Uh, no, actually, quite the opposite. <laughs> actually, Dad, there have been a lot of demonstrations here in Washington. People do not want more war. Uh, spend tax dollars at home. Create more American jobs. That message has a certain appeal with this administration. Huh, that's good to hear. Well, tomorrow, tomorrow let's install that voice activated software on my computer so I can finally catch up on my emails. And for God's sakes, let's fix that radio or get a new one. I need my NPR. Oh, tomorrow, well actually dad, tomorrow, tomorrow we're gonna go visit to that Korean spy you like so much in Virginia. Doctor's orders. The next morning, we're driving out to Virginia. <clears throat> this is my first day outside since I've been released from the hospital. Maggie's driving, and I'm sitting in the, the passenger seat looking out the window to see what's changed. I'm expecting, I don't know, billboards of Hillary Clinton or something, but, but there's nothing. People are just walking around, even even look a little depressed. <laughs> look, Hillary Clinton is far from perfect. And on foreign policy issues, she was pretty hawkish. But imagine what would have happened if we'd elected 
Donald Trump. <laughs> more war, more poverty, more climate change. I guess after a while, people stop saying to themselves, geez, I, I guess it could have been worse. But then I see these two guys on the sidewalk in Arlington, and they've got these t-shirts. And on their t-shirts is Donald Trump. And not just Donald Trump, but Donald Trump in the Oval Office. Maggie, do you see those guys? Do you see those t-shirts? What, what does that mean? Oh, Dad, I should have told you. <laughs> Donald Trump has a new reality show. It's called <laughs> Oval Office. He <laughs> pretends he's president, but basically he just plays golf and gives speeches. It's not popular, is it? Worst ratings ever. <laughs> I love this Korean spa out in Virginia. They have these masseuses there that can work out every kink in your body. They don't speak much English and I don't speak Korean, but I just lie there and they tenderize my body like mm. it's a slap of beef. But, but this time, Mrs. Kim, my masseuse, she's not there. And I'm, I'm lying there, and in walks in this tall blonde with a Russian accent and, and shoulders like a linebacker. <laughs> Mrs. Kim, a family emergency. I am Tatiana. I am your masseuse. Okay. You relax. I hear you have bad car accident. I am careful. Well, thank you. Uh, Tatiana, I, I have a question. What do you think about President Clinton? President Clinton. I was not in country when he was president. <laughs> no, no, not, not Bill Clinton. Hillary Clinton. Hillary. She did the best she could. Now, no more questions. You must relax. <laughs> By the end of the day, I am very relaxed. In fact, driving home, sitting in the passenger seat, I'm so exhausted, I could just fall asleep. Something Tatiana said, is bothering me. She said she did the best she could. So I, I gather my strength to confront my daughter. Maggie, Maggie, you, you lied to me. What are you talking about, Dad? I wasn't in a coma for four months. I was in a coma for four years. What are you talking about, Dad? She said, Tatiana, that Hillary did the best she could. I must have slept through the entire Hillary Clinton administration. Dad, don't be crazy. Look, here's my phone. Take a look at it. The date. We're still in 2017. Maggie. Maggie, your, your email. There are messages here about Donald Trump, President Donald Trump. You lied to me. She must have lost. Dad, it was, you created this entire fake reality for me. Dad, it was for your own good. How could it be for my own good to live a lie like that? It makes no sense to stick our heads in the sand and pretend we didn't just elect the worst president in American history. God, Maggie, what has he done already? Has he built his wall? Has he kicked out all Muslims? Maggie, are we at war with North Korea? Dad, Dad, please, please relax. I can't believe this. You, you want me to get, get stronger, don't you? You want me to, 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 to get back my fighting spirit? Dad, your doctor said, forget the doctors. They're as bad as pollsters. I plan never to listen to them again. Now I feel, I feel more awake than I have in, in a dozen years. Maggie, 
Maggie, hurry home and no more arguments. We have a lot of work to do. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Sean, for that skit. That was really great. Um, and I want to say thank you to each of the panelists. We are now going to start a question and answer session. Rosanna and I will have a few questions to start off the conversation, but then we are going to open it up to everyone in the audience. Um, and, you know, if we're going back to that original theme of connecting um, uh, what happens globally to what happens locally, um, I'm reminded of the 2014 murder of um, the Palestinian teenager, Mohammed Abu Khabir, um, which immediately preceded the 2014 Gaza war. Uh, and just to refresh people in the room about that particular incident, um, a 31-year-old settler from the West Bank and two teenage accomplices found um, Hamid in East Jerusalem, kidnapped him, um, bludgeoned him, doused him with gasoline, and burned his body alive. Um, and they, when asked about their motivation for this killing, they um, pointed to the fact that three Israeli settlers had been kidnapped um, and killed ostensibly by Palestinians. And while the family of those um, three settlers that were murdered swore that they didn't want revenge for the killing, Benjamin Netanyahu, through a series of very, very um, militant tweets, um, tweeted things like, vengeance for the blood of a small child, Satan has not yet created. Um, so he was quoting an Israeli poet, um, Chaim Bialik. So, um, and then, you know, it just, it just um, descends into, they are abducted and murdered in cold blood by human animals. On behalf of the entire Jewish people, I would like to tell the dear families, the mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, and brothers and sisters, we are deeply saddened. The entire nation weeps with you. And so that he's utilizing, you know, the prime minister's office or the prime minister himself is utilizing this Twitter account to kind of rally people up. And then what happens? You have this murder in a forest in occupied Jerusalem. And so here we're instantiating a, a national policy, a national fury, um, which then enables vigilantism by citizens and select groups of citizens because there is a culture of impunity. Um, and so, you know, if we kind of tie that immediately to the um, lynching of Richard Collins that happens at UMD campus this weekend, we're seeing that same sort of national legislation, national policies which demonstrate there's no consequence for, for racist um, motivated hate crimes. Um, and, you know, if, if, if these crimes occur, there's, there's no punishment, no real, um, you know, people are often acquitted. So again, um, you know, I just wanted to kind of put those two murders um, in uh, side by side and kind of analyze them. Um, and my question is, you know, in what ways is the situation in Israel and the territories it occupies a harbinger of things to come in the United States? Again, what happens in, in the colonies, what happens in an empire, how it affects policies we have uh, domestically? And that's the question. Well, I'll jump into one part of it. Um, others can pick up other parts. It, it seems to me that there is a significant overlap in strategies of repression that are exchanged on a regular basis between the US and Israel. Uh, I think there are times that people try to say, oh, the US is doing Israel's bidding or something like that, which I think is rarely or virtually never the case. The US operates on its own interests um, but what is true is that the political connections to Israel, which parallel but are not the same as the strategic connections, the strategic being the military, uh, economic, the, the more fundamental links that tie the U.S. to Israel, uh, which are operated through the State Department and the Pentagon and the White House, are separate but parallel to the political ties that emerge through Congress. Uh, where it's much more of a political relationship, the role of the pro-Israel lobbies, et cetera. 
what we see, I think, very often is the collaborations between those two. And what we've been increasingly seeing in the last, say, five years is the rise in collaboration between police forces. So you have numerous U.S. police forces, including, for example, the police in Ferguson, who were trained by Israeli military forces. Because in Israel, the military and the police are quite similar, unlike here, where there's a bigger gap between them. Uh, and in a number of um, cities around the country, counties, states, you see funds being raised by pro-Israel lobby groups to, among other things, pay for the training of local police, either in Israel or by Israelis who come to the US. So that parallels the, the rise of the militarization of police that is a, a US policy. You know, we, also, we didn't only see uh, police officials in Ferguson who had been trained by the Israeli military, we also saw a tank in the streets of Ferguson that was provided not by the Israelis, but by the Pentagon, because that's part of a way of dealing with the wars abroad that when they, they, they're cyclical, when they go through a downside, there's all this equipment left. There's tanks, there's bombs, there's bullets, there's guns, there's all these things they don't want to just leave, in this case, in Afghanistan or in Iraq, because who knows who's going to get control of it. So what do we do? We bring it home. And then what do you do with it? What do you do with a bunch of old tanks, right? You can't just sort of put them in a landfill somewhere. So you offer them to police forces around the country who say, well, we've got some problems in our African-American communities. We could use a tank. Really? You could use a tank? But once you have a tank, yeah, you're going to use a tank. You're going to use a tank. You're going to use whatever that equipment is. You're going to use whatever that training provides you with. So that's where I think we see that parallel. I don't think that we are in a, an era where the U.S. is going to become a, uh, or that the, the internal colonies of the U.S. are going to be uh, emerging the way the occupied Palestinian population or the, those of uh, Palestinians who are denied the right of return. I don't think we're going to see the parallels in that sense. But I think there are clear connections that go forward when you have one of the most militarized uh, occupations around going on in Palestine. Uh, you see those tactics, those strategies being taken up by other repressive regimes, whether in Washington or in anywhere else around the world. Um, so I'll add, just add a quick note and perhaps more broadly, I think um, we had talked about this earlier. I'm thinking more about the connection between um, state violence and hate crimes, um, something that's very much present in the United States, right? So we often, I think, have the tendency to think that sort of hate crimes um, exist as some sort of distinct type of violence from what happens at the state level, right? However, the reality of the situation is that what the state does sort of sets the precedent for the way a particular group can be treated. So when we have uh, a set of policies over the last 15, 16 years in the course of the war on terror that specifically target and demonize Muslims, it sends the message to society that it is okay for you also to exact violence on this particular population. And what the state also sends a message of is that there will be no accountability, as there hasn't been any accountability, right? Whether we're talking about torture at Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib, any of the CIA black sites, surveillance, whatever it is, there has been almost zero accountability. So again, this sends the message to society that it is okay. And similarly, this exists in a cyclical process such that what happens at the societal level gives ammunition, gives justification to the state because the state in order to implement certain laws and policies has to know that there's broad support, broad based support for what they're going to do, right? Um, in the case of the Muslim ban, perhaps this is one of the, the points that kind of stands out in the war on terror, but if the state kind of has to take its cues from society. So they operate in tandem and it's very cyclical. And we can see that in um, Israel, Palestine. Phyllis talked about it from a different angle, but in terms of this angle of sort of the state setting again, this precedent for how a group can and should be treated, that is exactly the same mechanism that's operating here. Um, I, I had a couple of questions, but in the interest of trying to end on time, I'm going to cut it back to one and then open it up the floor for um, a Q&A. 
Uh, so as Phyllis mentioned, Trump just came back from his first international trip um, in which the US made an arms deal, a $110 billion arms deal with Saudi Arabia, weapons which will most likely be used in the war in Yemen. Uh, my question is, what role, what role do you think wealthy Arab countries such as Saudi Arabia play in perpetuating the global war on terror um, while they themselves are part of corrupt governments and perpetuate human rights abuses in relation to those Arab co or countries that are affected by the global war on terror? And how do you see these eventual consequences playing out on an international scale? Good questions. <laughs> you want to jump first, John? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> well, there's connections to Asia. Um, I think that what we were seeing in Riyadh was an effort to consolidate an already existing alliance between the U.S. and a host of Sunni Arab countries led by either absolute monarchies, uh, or in some cases, military dictatorships passing themselves off as elected governments. Primarily the, the Arab petrostates of the Gulf, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. Qatar, Jordan, the only exception being Oman, uh, the UAE. These are strategic allies of the US, far beyond oil. You know, the US doesn't bring in as much oil from anywhere in the Middle East as it does from Africa. That's been true since 2010. Uh, so it's not about getting Middle Eastern oil particularly, although oil pipelines and access to determining who controls which contracts and all of that is still a factor, but it's much more about the strategic role. So strategically, if you look at a map of the world, the Middle East is the best place. If you want to be somewhere where you can strike militarily three giant continents, the Middle East is where you want to be. You can get to Africa, Europe, and Asia. And this so-called lily pad theory of the Pentagon, which is these bases that are scattered around where they can move troops from one to another, jumping from across water or across land, across air, from one to another and, and move in a very flexible way, the Middle East is made for that. So you have Qatar hosting central command. You have Bahrain, this tiny little island state uh, that's hosting the fifth fleet. You have Saudi Arabia as the major strategic ally of the United States in the region. You have the UAE hosting U.S. troops and acting as an agent for the U.S. in all of these arenas. So in all of these ways, these countries are playing the major on the ground role in, uh, in the so-called global war on terror. But at the same time, they are fueling both directly and indirectly that same force that they are supposedly against, that is terrorist forces uh, that are operating in the region. What we see right now with the increased focus on Iran has everything to do with this struggle for regional hegemony. Uh, there was a time when there were only two countries in the world, in the region, that had the capacity to emerge as regional powers, meaning they had size of land and population, they had money, mainly from oil, and they had water. There were only two countries that had all three. That was Iran and Iraq. So not surprisingly, those were the two targets of the U.S. through the years of what they called dual containment, the Iran-Iraq war, where the U.S. essentially supported both sides, armed both sides, gave a little more to the Iraqis because, not because we loved Saddam Hussein more than the Ayatollah in Iran, but because Iraq was the weaker side and they wanted to keep the fighting going. So they supported the weaker side to kind of bring them up to, up to snuff. So the war continued for a decade and, and slaughtered enormous numbers of young Iranians and young Iraqis to huge social costs to the countries. So you have this scenario where the, uh, the question of who can be the, the regional hegemon was very limited. Then the US goes in and invades Iraq, wipes out the, the social capital of the country, essentially shreds the social fabric, destroys Iraq. So suddenly Iran emerges as the only possible regional hegemon. That's not okay. The U.S. doesn't want Iran to be it, for God's sakes. Iran doesn't like us. That's the way it's sort of interpreted. So what do you do? You start looking for others. Turkey suddenly emerges. Turkey, which was always known as the poor man, it was rather sexist, but rather true economically, the poor man of Europe, through several years, early years of the AKP party in, in Turkey, they were doing pretty well. Suddenly, and they had size and water, 
suddenly they have money also. So Turkey starts to emerge as a potential regional power. And then suddenly with all of the possibilities for, for new, uh, um, both with money, with oil money and with new technologies, Saudi Arabia's lack of water doesn't seem to be quite as much of a problem anymore. So suddenly Saudi Arabia is the other possible uh, regional power in here. So you have these countries vying with each other. And part of it is all about vying with the US to be the favored ally. Because remember, at the end of the day, the favored ally is still going to be Israel. But Israel is tiny. It's isolated. And even though it's the wealthiest by far, it's the most militarized by far, has the, the strongest military by far in the region, the fourth strongest military in the world, and it has the backing of the United States, it can't really be a regional hegemon in the same way because everybody hates it. So that makes it a little tricky. So you have this fight going on for who are going to be the others. And so what we saw in this case on this speech in this trip was precisely the goal of bringing Israel into that Sunni Arab core so that Israel gets to join the club with all these other dictators and military whatevers um, so that they can be part of the, of the game. They can be part of the game. And Saudi Arabia is on top. Qatar and the UAE are kind of struggling to, to get their own place in the, in the, at the table. But it's basically now about Saudi Arabia and Israel becoming, once again, as they used to be along with the, the Shah of Iran in the old days, it was those three that were the key pillars of U.S. policy in the region. Some things go around and come around. Um, at this time, we should um, yeah. take questions from the audience. So if anyone has a question for any of the panelists, please raise your hand. Yeah. <clears throat> I just wanted to broaden it from, um, from Islamophobia to xenophobia. I mean, just the nationalistic movements, whether they're in Indonesia or, or China or, uh, or Russia, France, the United States. You know, broader and slightly, or in Zionism, or in the Palestinian. I mean, you know, just the this growing nationalism, which is to me very, very scary. Mm -hmm. I could perhaps start in on that. Um, I mean, nationalism has been with us for you know a long time, I mean, the beginning of the 19th century, and we certainly saw a great flowering of nationalism uh, at the end of the 19th century, and then leading up to World War I. I think we, there was a, a tendency during the Cold War period, to, especially among political scientists, to assume that nationalism was on its way out. That these supranationalists, whether it's communism or liberal internationalism, uh, were encroaching upon the territory that nationalism once claimed. And the nationalism as an artifact of the 19th century would wither away and die. And to a certain extent, the, the um, Francis Fukuyama argument at the end of history, immediately following the fall of the Berlin Wall, was the highest expression of that. All of the, the passions that would, would lead us to war would disappear, and we'd all turn into bureaucrats at the end of the day. Clash of Civilizations was the, the retort by Samuel Huntington that this was not the case, that, that we would see these kind of age-old passions uh, packaged perhaps differently. And since that time, you know, the, the question of rising nationalism has been with us. I would argue it has never really gone away. It's always been there. I mean, even the communist countries that were supposedly internationalist were always nationalist at their core, whether it was Stalinism or Ceausescu uh, or the Chinese or, you know, Kim Il-sung in North Korea. Um, but what's different about the moment right now is that while well, communism is decisively uh, not an ideology that exercises much influence in the world, but liberal internationalism is in retreat as well. That the, the case against globalization, the case against uh, elites that have been uh, you know, orchestrating global economy, whether through international financial institutions or through uh, national banks, this argument has become extraordinarily uh, influential, in part because the global economy has not delivered the goods to large portions of the population. Um, and liberal internationalists haven't come up with an effective answer to that, you know, I mean, to Clinton's 
Hillary Clintons of the world. Um, and so they will continue to lose. And in fact, although Macron won in France, the French are deathly afraid that, that Le Pen will come back because you know, his policies of rebel internationalism will be discredited <coughs> by stagnation or worse in the French economy. Um, Asia, you know, China has, has offered its version, a kind of internationalism with its one road, one belt program, enormous investments into infrastructure in the periphery around China in an attempt both to raise the waters and lift all boats and also to sustain China's economic growth. And to a certain extent, that is a form of supranationalism. Everyone get on board for this new Asia uh, approach. But if you look more carefully, you'll see that there's tremendous nationalist backlash against that particular program in Myanmar, uh, in Philippines, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, uh, even in North Korea, <coughs> supposedly China's closest ally. Um, so I would argue, or I have, I have argued, that this nationalism, um, and in fact, this paradoxical structure that has emerged, what could be called the nationalist international, of people joining hands across nationalist ideologies, whether it's Trump and Brexit people, Trump and Le Pen, Putin and Orban, this nationalist international, this paradox, this oxymoron, is only going to get stronger unless some other form of internationalism comes forward. This, of course, leads us directly to Dr. Venice, who writes about the new internationalism and about what kind of internationalism <clears throat> could re represent a response to this, these trends. Uh, can I just add one quick thing, which is to say that, um, you know, I think we have to think about nationalism differently in different contexts. So when we're talking about the US, for example, and or in Europe, nationalism is very prescriptive in terms of who does that embody? And what are the barriers to entry, right? You can't as a Moroccan or Libyan or whoever it is, Algerian um, immigrant to various European countries, you can't necessarily be part of the nationalist movement. And not to say that you would necessarily want to be, but there's this idea of nationalism around sort of whiteness and shaping the, the narrative of, of, of nationalism around uh, whiteness, right? So in the US, it's very much alive. It's not just nationalism, it's white nationalism. People that are not white are not um, in that category of nationalism. They don't identify with it. It's not something that resonates with them. It's not something that, you know, is really um, advancing their sort of, I guess, perspective or like way of being in the world. It's just not sort of a, I don't think it's a concept that we think about. It's different if you talk about Egypt where it's a relatively homogenous society and nationalism has a very different context there. But when you're talking about nationalism in um, very heterogeneous societies in which whiteness is very much a part of the history and culture and social political economic systems, um, I think it takes a different shape. And I think we have to think about that in terms of how much of a threat it is, not just to um, justifying war and repression, but how it affects various communities domestically and internationally. I think that's very important. Um, and I think that it goes to, I mean, in, in both of these situations where we're talking about the rise of nationalism, it has come out of a different era in a sense. So if, if we look at the, the period of the 90s, you saw the, it was the end, it was the post-Cold, the immediate post-Cold War period, which was also, the Cold War was also the period of decolonization struggles, liberation movements, wars of liberation, which were nationalist at their core. It wasn't only the successful ones that moved into socialist uh, claims, more or less accurate claims, uh, that called themselves, you know, the People's Republic of this or that. But it was also, it was the nature of, of decolonization was nationalism for indigenous populations that had been colonized. And then you get into like the 90s, and that was a very progressive process that saw the rise of the United Nations. The, you know, the first thing independent countries would do is take their seat in the General Assembly. It was both symbolic and real to see that process go forward. At the same time, when, when you get to the next phase, when you have the end of the, of the Cold War, corresponding to the end of these wars of, liber of national liberation, the end of direct colonialism in most places, Palestine being the outlier uh, because it was created at the, at the end of the period of colonization. But in the main, decolonization struggles are ending and suddenly you have a very different 
scenario where you have these micro-nationalisms that emerge. So in Bosnia or in, in the Balkans overall, you saw it in a few other places where you have countries where there had been a kind of nationalism suddenly splitting up into smaller entities. And then the smaller entities divide again and it becomes based on individual, on, on issues of race and ethnicity and language and religion that divide people. So it's no more the, 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 the question of land and the, and the link to the land. So it's a very different kind of nationalism, which ended up being very reactionary in that period. What we're seeing now, in a sense, is a new kind of challenge, not just to nationalism, but to nation states. So this was the great call of ISIS, ironically. They weren't the first to say that these were colonial borders that have no legitimacy, but they obviously treated it in a very different way. But the rise of political Islamism in, throughout the, the Middle East and other parts of the world is also a reflection of the failure of some of these earlier struggles. So if you look at the Arab world, you see the fit that largely, not entirely of course, but largely the failure of Arab nationalism, the failure of Arab socialism, the failure of pan-Arabism, the failure of Arab neoliberalism certainly. And so the latest version of opposition movements is shaped by Islamism. Now, is it gonna do any better in my view? Probably not for a whole host of reasons. But that's sort of what exists now. And it has its reactionary, its fascist, and its relatively progressive, uh, relatively progressive um, as a secular person who doesn't really like religion to be part of the leadership of movements at all. That's my personal opinion. But I don't think that's going to work at the end of the day. But we're seeing very different versions of what political Islam can, can be. But it's all in the context of this is the latest version of how to challenge these interventionist campaigns that are going on around the world. And then just finally, what is a new internationalism going to look like? I think it's really different than 20 years ago when I first came to IPS and started to work on this question and came up with that title for my project. It was a lot then about the reclaiming the United Nations, reclaiming the notion of the United Nations as the, the best hope, granted all its limitations, but the best hope for combining multilateralism with individual solidarity. The UN isn't that anymore. It's weaker than ever. Uh, and whether it can be reclaimed, I think is a much bigger doubtful question. I don't think it's a lost cause yet, but it's gonna be a lot harder. So I think we're in a very transitional moment. And I don't know what, this, what the new internationalism is going to look like. I just know we need one. What about the internet and social media as the new internationalism? Um, because I've made many friends, especially in Arab countries, through Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so, and I'm not alone. And so, um, and the fact that, you know, no matter what, no matter how poor people are, many people still have cell phones and they still it's have true. video cameras. And so that's a way of bridging the gap across all uh, nations, religions, um, uh, income brackets. That's certainly possible, um, and it it's it has its. I think in the same way that Phyllis was talking about, you know, the, the progressive and the you know, less progressive or the reactionary versions of Islamism. You have the progressive versions of social media or the progressive uses of social media. You have the reactionary uses of social media. Uh, we all know that Facebook has a tendency to. Um, create silos of, uh, of interest groups. Um, and while we, we internationalists are, are relishing this opportunity to reach across borders and make these friends and create new communities, fundamentally, that did not exist previously, could not exist previously. The same holds true for neo-Nazis who are finding, ah, I can connect to my friends in Germany and my friends in Russia and precisely these uh, in Washington. The, the white racist, white nationalist <laughs> that Maha was talking about, they too are using this. And, you know, I, there's a, a recent piece on, on how effectively Trump used, used Facebook to get elected. Um, very targeted, something we weren't paying any attention to because we thought Facebook is ours. <laughs> you know? But no, it's a technology that in some sense is neutral and can be used by anybody for whatever purpose. 
And I would, I would add, I mean, I think the, maybe a larger point you're getting at is more so the democratic access to information, right? And people can make those connections and, you know, there's just more access to information. Um, on the other hand, I think when we're talking about internationalism, it's not simply about, you know, becoming aware or cognizant of the struggles of other people. It's really about dismantling the power structures because you can't really um, emerge into the global sphere without recognition of some of the historical aspects of the various hierarchies. So it's not, again, it's not just about, okay, well now I have a friend in the Middle East and now we can just forget about colonization in the Middle East. We can forget about neo-colonialism, neo-imperialism. It's really about, you know, how do we use those connections to understand the struggles, to uplift those struggles, and then think about what does it mean to leverage our own power and privilege in those, um, in this sort of context and atmosphere. Yeah, I just want to add something. Like, I think technology has the potential to amplify existing tendencies. It's not creating things, mm -hmm. it's amplifying existing societal conditions. And so in that way, it's destructive. So like, mm -hmm. it's destructive to regimes, it's destructive to structures, and it can be, in, as John mentioned, a neutral force. Mm -hmm. It can be used by like negative actors and also positive actors. So I think um, what's, what's kind of uh, affirming about developments in technology is how they're utilized by social movements, mm -hmm. because I think there's a really revolutionary tendency, you know, whether in Palestine, people are communicating with each other about hunger strikes or here in like from Ferguson to Baltimore, et cetera, where you're organizing direct action online. So, I mean, there's a very positive, I think overall it's in the fact that it's disruptive, it's, it's uh, something that we can um, appreciate and understand that, you know, not everyone can control everything, that structures have weaknesses and they can be brought down and social media can be a tool in that. And I think just one quick thing, just adding to the narrative. So, you know, I started this campaign a long time ago called Muslim Apologies on Twitter. And it was basically about um, the idea that Muslims are constantly forced to condemn acts of terrorism perpetrated by other Muslims. So Muslims are apologizing for things like, you know, the, having the wrong character in The Lion King. But it's sort of like this cathartic act of like, okay, we're kind of taking this back. We're having some ownership over the narrative and really disrupting and challenging the dominant narrative. So in the sense that that kind of brings awareness, I think it, yeah, it's very helpful. I just want to add like one quick note on that. Um, I love the discussion of social media, but I think it's also important to um, caution against placing a large um, influence on social media. I think we saw that a lot with the Arab Spring where people thought, you know, the Arab, it's going, this is going to be the catalyst for it, which it was in some ways, but I think people put that on a pedestal and expected the Arab Spring to really um, be successful because of social media. Um, and it wasn't. Um, in some aspects it was, but mostly it wasn't. Um, and I also think that it brings up a danger of hashtag activism where people who do connect with people from the other side of the world or will share something on Facebook or, or Twitter or whatever it is, think that they and somehow are being politically involved, which they kind of are, but it goes a lot beyond just sharing or talking. Um, there's political movements and political action, which I think social media takes away. So I would just caution against placing a lot of emphasis on it. That's it. <laughs> okay. So I want to hear a little bit more about the implications of this administration's lack of coherence, to put it that way, but also um, some of the resistance that's coming from actually within the administration, right? The people, whoever they are, that are consistently leaking to the Washington Post and the New York Times in such a kind of strategic way as to undermine the legitimacy of, of the administration. And I think the reason why I asked that, I think Maha might have been the person to mention this, but you know, there's this sense that like the, the Fourth Circuit decision is really quite shocking because all of the time we see these very Islamophobic, extremely repressive, often on its face unconstitutional things that at the very least it takes the courts a long time to move on them if they ever do at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I actually wasn't surprised. Um, and the reason being that the courts had a stake in this, which is Trump has consistently tried to say that the courts don't have a role here, right? That the power is consolidated in the White House and that's it. So they have a stake in not letting him believe that. And so I guess my, my question is more in this kind of environment where there are multiple interests um, and there's the interests of people who have historically had power and now all of a sudden they're unsure if the person at the home will make it so that they can continue to have power and influence. And how does that kind of impact on a broader level 
these discussions about dismantling these power structures, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of this has a lot of historical precedent, but this is a new, somewhat of a new dynamic that we haven't seen in modern history before. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important question, and I don't think we yet know all the answers to it. I mean, I don't think we at this table do, but I don't think as, as a world, I don't think we really know the answers. I think that what we're looking at is a scenario in which the, the structures remain unchanged. People within them are different, and it turns out that it does matter who is positioned in various places in positions of power. But what one of the aspects that we're seeing now is the end of the period, at least for the moment, in which corporate power, which has always been the dominant force in the US economy and a dominant force on US politics, is not just a, the most important force, it's now making up the political echelon. The distinction between the corporate and the political has largely disappeared. So it's not just that you could say the cabinet represents the interests of major corporations. The cabinet is made up of CEOs of the major corporations. That's a very different scenario. It, do, it doesn't change where the interests lie, but it does change how they do it. So it also means we have to change how we challenge it. It makes it much more difficult in a, in a, number, of, in a number of ways. So I think that we're still sorting out some of that. It turns out, you know, if you look, for example, at people like um, Betsy DeVos at Education, whose economic interests are represented in the privatization of education and the destruction, the dismantling of public education. If you look at Rex Tillerson, whose personal investment, shall we say, of his financial wealth, his social engagement, is through the lens of being the CEO of the largest uh, oil company in, in the country. He's on the cabinet. He's not sort of reflecting the interests of. So it's a very different set of scenarios. Now, I don't think that tells us um, how this is going to play out. I think it, it's a very dangerous development because it consolidates that relationship between the democratic structures that still exist and the domination by the most undemocratic structures, which are giant corporations. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we're grappling with right now. And where I think it becomes, where I think the resistance becomes so important is that there are still people making those judgments. So there are still individual judges deciding, am I going to give in and move with the White House trajectory, or am I gonna stand with the resistance and let Trump come out and call me whatever it was he called Judge Wat uh, Watson from, from Hawaii. Uh, and people more and more are saying, I'm not going to stand for it. I'm not going to stand for it. I think we will be seeing maybe fairly soon, maybe it'll take a bit longer, a shift from leaking information to leaking people, where people are going to start leaving. There's already, there's been in, in the mainstream press, I, I saw one in the Post and one in the Times, I think, op-eds of people basically writing to other elites saying, okay, we tried it, it didn't work, no one should go to work for this administration. Because if you do, you will be seen as complicit, even if either you are already there or you view it as a way to, from the inside, do whatever. It's not okay, just don't go to work there. And I think we're going to be seeing more and more people leaving and taking their information and their files with them. We will see, and I'm not proposing that anyone should do that. I'm just saying, I think we will see more and more people doing it. And in the same way that we're seeing more and more people leaking more and more information, partly people are leaking to Twitter and television because they know that's the only way to get the attention of the president. So that's another phenomenon we've never had to deal with before. So, yeah. I would, I would add that uh, you know, the conventional portrayal of the administration up to this point has been between the nationalists and the globalists. And I think Phyllis points out importantly that both the nationalists and the globalists were corporate. <laughs> they just represented right. different aspects of, of corporate wings, approach. Exactly. And, uh, and up until very recently, it was assumed that Trump stood with like Steve Bannon and the nationalists. And in fact, what they were interested in was changing structures, not just changing people. They wanted to dismantle as much as they could 
of what they saw as the administrative state. And some of the budget that we talked about earlier is part of, it, of that dismantlement. But most recently, Trump has come out and said, I'm a nationalist and I'm a globalist, which was in some sense a shock, but it also represented a, a subtle shift, maybe not so subtle shift, within the administration and a recognition that the Trump, as he starts to travel, as he starts to, you know, uh, present that side of his character, uh, understands that he is a member of the global elite and, and will be representing the U.S. in those institutions. Um, and we will see this continued conflict between these two aspects of, of corporations as they're represented in the administration. The ones that are mostly about, um, uh, you know, e extraction industry, uh, manufacturing in the United States, bringing back coal, et cetera, and those that are financial, mar largely financial, representing Wall Street interests, and their counterparts overseas. And that will produce, I think, some very interesting leaks uh, over the next, next few months. Can I just add one thing? So I think I, I like your question a lot because you were talking about sort of this existential threat that the courts are facing, right? And it's interesting now that it, it surfaced under Trump and the way you're describing it, right, is more that it's a resistance to Trump as opposed to per se, like an explicit resistance to the Islamophobic policies, which I think is very interesting when you think about obviously what happened under Obama being that, you know, he was referred to as a deporter in chief. He exponentially increased the use of drones. Under his administration, Anwar al-Awlaki was assassinated extrajudicially, and he was an uh, American citizen. Um, but there wasn't sort of that same outrage in terms of the response. So I think we have to think about that in terms of, you know, when we're trying to galvanize activists in this current moment, how do we get them to be as outraged about what's happening now as they, they should have been, you know, years before under Obama, under Bush, and to really cultivate that sense of awareness? Because what is happening now is not new, right? It's a continuation of the same old. And in fact, if uh, what, hadn't, what hadn't happened under Bush and Obama hadn't happened, we wouldn't be in the position we're in today. Trump could not have done what he's doing at this point in time without being building off what had previously happened. Um, maybe one or Thank two you. more questions. Probably yeah, one more time. Trying to get Andrew in the back. Um, um, yeah, sure. So maybe there is something new and different now that the political discourse has changed in a certain way that American civil society, given what, given the kind of language that Trump has been using in his campaign, has has been you know, an emergence of political blocks to support maybe 20% of the population. It seems to be almost unshakable that however government much lies, however says that this this group of supporters is fundamentally irrational. And was wondering if you know if, if one of the questions I think is is what about American civil society and how, the, the the challenge you, you talk about the political things that he's doing but in terms of the, the damage that he's done to the, the it seems as if the, the liberal discourse was that was once hegemonic has lost its hegemony it's no longer it's no longer has has the authority that it once did. This seems to be a certain kind of problem for the fundamental fabric of, of this democracy, does it not? In, in terms of the, that, and that seems to be something that's fundamentally different than with the, you know, under Obama and with the Bush and the way not to that. Maybe we should take one more question and then we can just do a, okay, and then a we'll wrap up. Yeah. So I, I, I challenge that. I think the progressives have made it so difficult to really have credibility mm -hmm. in criticizing what Trump is doing to social media is even a bunch of hard assets when mm -hmm. Obama was coming out. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, I, my anger toward Obama mm -hmm. and the Democratic hierarchy for sabotaging efforts on the part of progressives mm -hmm. to gain control, mm -hmm. Keith Ellison and Bernie Sanders and Hillary was complicit. I think it's a real dilemma in terms of credibility. Um, and, and I think one of the questions, are, are, have you submitted op-ed pieces to say the Baltimore Sun to use the figures that you used in your introduction in terms of jobs? Those, those people in Baltimore have been absolutely at the best of despair for since the 1980s. 
Well, I would say on both questions, um, the issue of civil society is fundamental. That's what makes up the resistance. Um, I think there's amazing work going on in Baltimore. I don't think it's only despair. I think there's incredible energy going on right now in Baltimore. Um, and I think it's, it's exciting and it's going to take a long time to rebuild. But I think civil society is um, uh, at a, a very, a moment of extraordinary mobilization that we haven't seen probably since uh, around 2007. Um, I, I agree that there was a significant decline in civil society engagement uh, during the Obama years, but to say that there was none, I think really misreads history. There was an enormous level of mobilization. Uh, there were enormous protests, there were enormous campaigns, uh, and we won uh, sometimes. We won the prevention of bombing Syria in 2013, and it was a huge uh, it was a, a huge, hard-fought effort. We won the Iran nuclear deal. That was a huge, hard-fought effort that, yes, that one was supported by the White House, thankfully, uh, but Congress was dead set against it, and the Israeli hierarchy and the pro-Israel lobbies were dead set against it, and it almost didn't get through. But it did, and we were able to protect it. So I think what, what you're raising, Andrew, I think is, is a crucial question in terms of what happens to civil society at moments when the discourse is in such disarray and such collapse. I mean, the, the whole question of uh, the way we discuss false news now as a given, that it's, it's a phenomenon that isn't a joke anymore. It's, it's a reality that was, the, the stage was set as social media uh, took over. It was always too easy to just assert things on the web and he would say, oh, well, I read it on the web. And say, oh, okay, well, that makes it true, doesn't it? You know, but now it's not only internet sources of dubious uh, uh, provenance, it's also mainstream media get, gets caught up in this stuff. So it's a very different reality. There is no overarching shared agreement, except I would posit that there is a wide majority. It's not universal, but if, and I don't know what the percentage is, 55, 60, 65% of people who agree that what the Trump administration has come to represent is not legitimate and does not represent what they believe this country should be. Now, within that, there's tons of differences between those who think it was something golden and, and the city on the hill before. That tends to be white people who live in areas not very close to any communities of color and people who realized that it never was that, but it had those aspirations, which were part of what made movements possible. The distinction that Howard Zinn drew was critical to that. You know, when it's what makes it possible to have movements against racism and against genocide and slavery right from the beginning is the belief that it could be something different. And I think that's what people still hold on to. And I think that's a majority. And I think that's what we saw with the Women's March. I think that's what we saw with flooding the airports for the defense against the Muslim ban. I think that's what we saw in the climate march. And I think that's what we are continuing to see now with the Indivisibles, where there are 6,000 chapters now of the Indivisibles around the country that nobody ever heard the word before in this context. And all of a sudden is the biggest civil society organization out there. You know, So all of that is a very different reality than we could have anticipated. And I think it's fantastic. Um, so I would say on the, you know, the note of the discourse, it's very interesting because I, I think in both cases, it's a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, you could argue that um, what Trump is doing and the way he speaks about Islam and Muslims and Latinos or whatever group you wanna make reference to is very problematic in that, right? It facilitates a very unsafe environment in which um, these communities increasingly become targets of their societies on the ground, as well as, of course, the policies he's promoting at the state level. On the other hand, what happened under Obama was Obama would very frequently, and actually Bush as well, would talk about Islam being a religion of peace, you know, they're part of the fabric of the, the US, they're part of our country, et cetera, et cetera. Then behind closed doors, there was drone attacks, there's Guantanamo, CIA black sites, et cetera, et cetera. So I think when we're thinking about what are the actual consequences, that really requires in-depth knowledge and study to know what are the precise consequences of the laws and policies. Again, you have to weigh that against what's happening internally in society 
to kind of get a more holistic picture. But I mean, to say that Obama's discourse was inherently better, yes, on the surface level, it was indeed. But then that really served to obscure what was happening behind closed doors. And <coughs> when we think about where it was sort of the anti-war movement and the peace movement, yes, there was a lot of resistance nonetheless under Obama. But again, um, as someone who studied the war on terror very closely for those years, it has been very interesting to me how much more support there is for the one thing or the two things that Trump has done versus the millions of things that Obama did in his eight year tenure. But those millions don't translate into jobs or toddlers or workers in Baltimore. And I, I've seen that continue. Mm -hmm. John? Uh, well, just on this question of uh, liberal discourse, and, um, you know, I, I study Eastern Europe in addition to East Asia, and I think we saw the first backlash against liberal discourse emerge there in the 1990s in a substantial way because of the association of liberals with economic reforms that didn't create jobs for people that were not uh, equitable in their, in their economic effects. Um, and we've seen, you know, the kind of culmination of that in Poland and Hungary. And, in, and the illiberal movements have been very smart because they've taken right-wing social po policies, xenophobia, racism, et cetera, and it, they've married it to left-wing economic policies in some cases. Uh, and uh, this is unprecedented in some sense for Eastern Europe. And I don't think it's quite happened here yet, although we did see some of that, obviously, with Trump support, people that went from supporting Bernie Sanders to voting for Donald Trump because they didn't see anybody else was, who was talking about jobs for workers. Mm -hmm. So that poses a major you know, uh, challenge for progressives. If we do not step up to the plate yeah. and provide a credible alternative that is, you know, uh, as it's basically liberal in the best sense right. of the word when it comes to social policy and progressive when it comes to economic policy, but really progressive. I mean, we have to, we have to fundamentally redesign you know, the, the Democratic Party, for instance, or third party platform and gear it toward jobs for folks in impoverished areas. If we don't do that, we, I think, as progressives, will continue to be locked out of politics. I think that is all the time we have for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us.